Okay, I'm Mazarin Banaji, and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Nilanjana Dasgupta, who's known to her friends as Buju, uh, and who I've known for, I computed this morning, 25 years. First as a grad student in my lab at Yale, then as a colleague, friend, and as somebody I have come to greatly uh, admire. Buju, as many of you know, teaches at UMass Amherst, where she's a professor in the Department of Psychology. But what you may not know is that this year, she has also taken on an additional role as director of the Institute of Diversity Science. S to just say a little bit about the kind of work she's interested in, I would say Buju's work is all about unleashing human potential. She cares deeply about so the, the processes that unfold in environments like the educational world or culture at large. And she's interested in looking at improvement. And as a result, she focuses, as so many of us do, on concepts like attitudes and beliefs and how to uh, change them. But much more specifically, she's interested in a particular set of beliefs and attitudes, and they come in the form of looking at the question of gender in STEM, unrepresented groups and their functioning in college. Uh, I was noticing a paper she has on her CV that I hadn't even read on, on, on that, that particular population and how it does in statistics classes. Um, she's interested in the role of peers, which is gonna be part of her talk today, in affecting other people's motivation to succeed. And when I think about her work, as chair of my department right now, I've been wondering if we shouldn't be using this quality as a metric in how we evaluate people. Uh, how much did A's work change the quality of B and C and D's work? We don't seem to ever compute that, but maybe there is a way to include that as uh, part of what makes a person a great citizen or a great good scientist and so on. She's interested in national identity as um, it plays out in a, our increasingly global world. Now, that's the, those are the topics of the research, but what I would say is that Buju's work is very, very unique. Um, it's unique in the sense that she has used a model that Bob Cialdini has called full cycle research, uh, which came from the Lewinian tradition of going from lab to field and back, and doing this over and over and over again. And out of it come really very wonderful things. Um, one of the other things I want to say about her is that she is the consummate scientist. I remember a long time ago, she published a paper where she showed that uh, men and women who went to singles, a single sex, um, men and women who went to a co-educational school or looked at the women from that school, as were women who went to a single sex college. And initially the data looked very much like the women who went to the single sex college ended up showing lower gender stereotypes, even implicit gender stereotypes than those who had gone to the co-ed school. But when I say she's a consummate scientist, uh, she didn't publish the work that I think would have been publishable saying, look, single sex school made a difference. She dug and dug deeper until she found that it's really not single sex schools school that makes the difference, but the number of women teachers you've had. That just so happened to be more true in the single sex uh, all women's college. But really, you could go to a co-ed school, and by choosing courses um, that are taught by women, you are now at lower risk yourself for having a gender stereotype. So I think of that kind of care with which she does her work as amongst her most defining and admirable features. Buju has a dizzying number of research grants that she's gotten. And of course, research grants I think of as among the surest sort of ways in which we can know what our peers think about our work. And, and she has a huge number of them, uh, been very well funded for a long, long time. She has received SPSP's Application of Social and Personality Psychology Award and the Chancellor's Medal from uh, for distinguished faculty from her own school, the University of Massachusetts. So today, you're gonna help me welcome uh, Buju as she speaks about stemming the tide, and I'll let you read the, the, the subtitle of her talk.
So as uh, Mazreen said, I was trained as an experimental social psychology, and that's sort of my bread and butter. Um, but the wonderful thing about being an academic is that you can take your career wherever you want. And sometimes when opportunities open up to do field experiments and then quasi-experiments, I went down that road. Um, and now I sort of leap back and forth between lab and field, which you'll, which, you'll, which you'll see in my talk. So I want you to imagine two students, student A and student B. Um, in middle school, both these kids did equally well in math and science, and both were equally engaged. Then they go to high school, they're still performing equally well, but now student A seems somewhat less interested um, and less confident, and student B is the same as they were before. They graduate from high school, same GPA, and go to college. Student A ends up majoring in communication, student B in engineering. If you guess that student A is likely to be female and student B is likely to be male, you would be right most of the time. And this is the story of many kids around, around the US and in many countries around the world, but not, but not all. And in fact, if you look at international data on how students perform on standardized tests in, in science, you'll see on the panel on your left, girls and boys perform equally well in standardized tests in science across many countries, especially North America, Latin America, and Western Europe. But if you look on the right to what they major in when they go to university, that's when you see a big gender disparity. Young women are substantially less likely to major in the sciences than young men. You find the same pattern of data if you look at mathematics. Girls and boys perform equally well in math when they, when they are in middle and high school, but when they go to university, now women are significantly less likely to major in math intensive fields than, than, uh, than are men. These gender disparities in, in STEM education is what leads to a scarcity of women in science, technology, and engineering, which, as you probably know, are some of the fastest growing jobs in the global economy and also some of the most lucrative. And indeed, I think these gender disparities in STEM education translate into income inequality between women and men, even among those with college degrees. So the question is, what causes these gender differences? It's true, no doubt, that discrimination and glass ceilings play an important role, but that's not the whole story. Uh, there's been a bunch of people, both academics and, and public intellectuals and journalists alike, who have argued that sometimes women and girls who are well qualified uh, lose interest in, in, in STEM uh, and, quote, freely opt out of STEM careers. And this is a position taken by several, and I want to uh, give you my favorite quote from the Boston Globe published about 10 years ago, where the journalist was trying to explain the persistent gender gap in science, engineering, and tech, and cited social science research that said, quote, when it comes to certain math and science related jobs, substantial numbers of women, highly qualified for the work, stay out of those careers because they would rather do something else, unquote. So in other words, women have the freedom to say no to careers in science and technology, and if they freely choose that, uh, what's the problem? The problem is that, that the, the tacit assumption underlying this article and the data on which it was based, is as if individual's decision to choose one discipline over another, one profession over another, as if it's a free choice, determined solely by one's talent and intrinsic motivation, unconstrained by societal forces. The question is, are these choices really free? And that's the question I'm interested in. Are, might individual's freedom be constrained by subtle cues in achievement context that signal who belongs there and who is likely to make it and who doesn't belong and may not make it? I propose, like to several others whose, whose work is on social identity threat, that people tend to gravitate towards fields where they feel comfortable, where they feel they fit, because those fields fit with favorable stereotypes about their own group. And people tend to move away from other fields where they feel uncomfortable, because those other fields fit with unfavorable stereotypes about their own group. If that's true, and I should say, this happens independent of, of individuals' objective talent.
So this gravitating towards some fields and moving away from others might be in some cases only weakly correlated and sometimes not at all with real ability. If this is true, then what factors might release these constraints and enhance individuals' real freedom to pursue any academic or professional path they wish, despite stereotypes to the contrary? So this is the, the work that I'm interested in. And to uh, tackle this question, um, about 10 years ago or so, I developed this model called the stereotype inoculation model. So a quick heuristic way to describe this model is by using a biomedical metaphor. And you'll see why social vaccine. The idea is just as a biomedical vaccine protects and inoculates our physical body against noxious bacteria, so too, I would argue, exposure to experts and peers from one's own group protect and inoculate one's mind against noxious stereotypes. In other words, coming into contact with experts and peers from one's own group function as social vaccines for for individuals who are underrepresented. So let me sort of visually show you what the model looks like and then sort of the four primary predictions uh, that, that we, we started with. First, I apologize for the small uh, font. I don't know if you can see it from the back, but I'll, but I'll read it out, that we think that a big, big factor that determines students' um, preferences and choices has to do with the learning environment in which they are. Specifically, who are the experts they see and who are the peers they see in those learning environments. Environments. So I predict that the more students see experts and peers from their own group, the more likely they are to have uh, more uh, self-efficacy or confidence, have a, a greater sense of motivation, feelings of belonging, and less worries and anxieties. Seeing experts and peers from one's own group in that learning environment should also bolster positive attitudes toward that discipline, a sense of identification with that field, and further downstream, lead to more engagement in class, more effort, better performance, uh, more intentions to take the next step down that career, and ultimately, uh, more desire to, to pursue careers in that field. So that's sort of, think of it as bucket number one, prediction number one. We also think that exposure to experts uh, from one's own group matters especially for students who are both numerically underrepresented in a field and who have to contend with negative stereotypes about their group. Why? Because for numerically minor, uh, minority students and also for students who have to contend with negative stereotypes, seeing successful people from your own group undercuts the power of those stereotypes and makes it more plausible to imagine yourself in those shoes. Three, we predict that, again, the, this exposure to experts from your own group is particularly likely to be impactful if people subjectively identify with those experts. You may see experts from your own group, but if you don't feel similar to them, their impact on the self-concept is likely to be weak. So that subjective identification matters a lot. And finally, we predict that the impact of this learning environment has an influence on students' self-concept in ways that may be fairly subtle and implicit, in the sense that when you ask students, they may not know that the presence or absence of who they see in their major, in their class, has any impact on their own choices. We tend to think of our career trajectories as entirely internally driven, driven by my interest, my, my sort of talent, and so on. Uh, but as social psychologists, if we do the right study, we should be able to see if the presence or absence of other people who belong to demographically similar groups has any impact on, uh, on individual self-concept, even if that impact may be fairly implicit. So my students and postdocs and I over the last 10 years have been testing different pieces of this model. And we started testing it in, in some ways because it was more convenient using girls and women in science and engineering as a case in point. Um, and so the data that I'll show you today have to do with gender in the context of STEM. But the general model applies, can apply to lots of groups who are both underrepresented and stereotyped negatively. So it could apply to students uh, of color in, in academic institutions. It, it could apply to first generation college students uh, and so on. And in my new work, which I'll show you a little bit of data, but not a lot. We are looking at the impact of intersectional identities, so kids' identity with both their race and gender groups and their impact on uh, these kinds of processes. But for today's talk, I'll focus on, on gender. 
So in, a, in one of our first studies uh, looking at this sort of broad social vaccine hypothesis, we turned to calculus because calculus classes have some are sort of the gateway course that is required for all STEM majors at every, every campus nationally and internationally. And we wanted to uh, see whether coming in contact with female faculty who are teaching calculus has differential impacts on women and men in their classroom. So I went and made friends with, with the, the chair of the department at the time in math and stats, and with his help conducted this study um, in their calculus class. The beauty of this, of this calculus class is that it was humongous, broken down into multiple small sections. So we recruited uh, students, both women and men, from multiple sections of this class, and we followed them from the beginning of the academic year, typically their first year in college, till the end of the year. And it's after this class that students typically uh, start dropping out or staying in STEM majors. And this, as I said, is required for all STEM majors. Um, we recruited a bunch of people who were from sections taught by female professors and another bunch of students who happened to be in sections taught by male professors. Um, the, again, the, the reason why this was perfect for a social psychologist is that all of these sections had the same syllabus, the same exams. Um, they were graded in a de-identified way, so students didn't know who was going to grade their exam. Um, and students signed up, registered for the class before the faculty had been assigned to teach the class. So they couldn't have self-selected into a section taught by a particular faculty. So as you can see, even though there was no random assignment to condition, this was a real jackpot in terms of uh, these studies, in terms of trying to do a quasi-experimental study. Uh, also, students and, and uh, faculty were completely blind to hypotheses. So we measured a bunch of things, and I'll just mention the ones that I'll talk about today. We measured students' attitudes towards calculus, math relative to a humanities subject like English. We me measured it using standard self-report measures uh, that other people had used before, but we also measured it indirectly using an implicit association test. And the basic gist of IATs, for those of you who don't, uh, don't know, or any other implicit measure that relies on response latency, the idea is that if I really like some concept, like mathematics, then when I think about that, good thoughts should pop into my mind quickly and automatically, and negative thoughts should be slower to come to mind. So my speed of response to math and good relative to English and good can be used as an indirect measure of my attitude strength. So we measured both by asking people, how much do you like math? And we also measured by using their response latency on, the, on this IAT. We also measured students' identification with, with math. So how much, how important was it to them to do well in, in math? And we used another IAT to measure their implicit identification with math. We measured their confidence in, in, in math and calculus, how well they thought they would do in the class. With their permission, we went to the college re university registrar and got their grades uh, in, in, in math. So let me show you what we found. So, these are uh, students' implicit identification with math. The black bars are female students. The gray bars are male students. The two bars on your left are students who happen to be in sections taught by female professors. The two bars on the right are male professors. What you can see is that for women, focusing on the black bars, they were significantly more likely to identify with math when their professor happened to be female, but less so when the professor happened to be male. For male students, the gender of the faculty had no impact on their identification uh, with, with math. We found the same pattern of data when we looked at implicit attitudes towards math. So on now on the y-axis, zero means that they're identifying with math and English about equally. Negative numbers means that they're strongly identifying, preferring English over mathematics. And again, the black bars are female students, the gray bars are male students. So what you're seeing is that for female students, when the professor is female, they're liking math and English about equally. When the professor is male, they have a strong preference for English over math. For male students, again, the gender of the professor has no impact on their implicit attitudes towards mathematics. We ask them, how confident do you feel about how you'll do, and what grade do you expect? So this is our measure of confidence. And again, you see that for women students, the black bars, they were significantly, they were more likely to say they would do well in the class when their professor was female rather than male. For male students, it didn't make a difference. This is despite the fact that students knew that the grading was done by all instructors, so it's not as if they expected their female professor to be more lenient. But so compare these, this graph about how confident students were 
were, students were, with how they actually did, their actual performance. In terms of their actual performance, if you look at the black bars, women outperformed male students across the board. Across all 15 sections, they got better grades in calculus, regardless of the gender of the professor. So clearly, the issue is not a matter of ability, but rather what's more fragile and labile, the thing that moves around, is their confidence. So this was a study that, that, uh, where we found that it was direct contact with these faculty over the course of the semester that had this protective social vaccine effect. What we wondered is what happens if female faculty are too few, which is often the case in engineering, computer science, uh, uh, math and stats and physics and in lots of other departments. Um, what do you do then? What do you do if contact is infrequent? Might it be the case that media exposure uh, to female scientists and professors might have uh, the same effect that real contact did? So this time, we did a regular randomized controlled experiment, this time in engineering. And we brought students, all women, from the College of Engineering into our lab and randomly assigned them to one of three conditions. We either showed them pictures and biographies of female engineers, so real people, some in industry, some in academia, some in government labs. So people like this uh, 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 electrical engineer, uh, Ayanna Howard, we talked about how she got interested in engineering. We took this information essentially from her website uh, and how she worked on, in NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we created this whole narrative and we showed these students multiple exemplars like this. Or we randomly assigned students to a condition where they read about male engineers. The, the, the biography was virtually identical. We only changed the pronouns, and we swapped out the picture with a, a sort of a, a, a picture of a, of a man with the, of the same race. Uh, so of course, this is a fictitious example. And we showed people multiple examples of male engineers like this. Or in the control conditions, they read about what engineers did, but we made no mention of gender. Then we measured their implicit attitudes towards, uh, towards engineering. And what we found, so these are students in engineering, right? So what we found is that for women who happen to read about female uh, engineers, the, the black bar, they showed significantly more positive implicit attitudes towards engineering. Whereas women who read about male engineers, the gray bar, or women who read about what engineers do with no mention of gender, the white bar, they showed strong preference for English over engineering. So these are students already in engineering, and in retrospect, I wish we had followed them over time, but at that time we didn't, because uh, I'm wondering whether the women who had negative attitudes ended up leaving engineering. Um, but, so stay focused on the black bar for a second. So we wanted to see whether the students who were in that female engineer condition, whether how much they identified with those engineers, whether that would predict their own self-efficacy and their career aspirations. So what we found is that the more students identified with the female engineers they read about, the more they felt a sense of self-efficacy in their own ability in engineering, which in turn statistically predicted uh, their career aspirations to stick it out in engineering. This pattern of data didn't happen for students who had been randomly assigned to read about male engineers. Um, so this is an example that even absent direct contact, just media exposure to examples of people in your field who are similar to you have a, have a strong positive impact on these women's self-concept. Um, and and it, that, that impact is stronger if they identify with the people they read about. So, so to go back to the model, so far I've shown you some data that has to do with the constructs in green. I've shown you some data that present, the presence of in-group experts um, has an impact on students' confidence. Uh, it has an impact on their positive attitudes towards the field, their identification with their field, and their career goals. I've shown you that this impact is stronger for women in STEM than men in STEM, and it's stronger when women subjectively identify with the exemplars they've seen. I've said nothing yet about uh, peers, where the peers can function as social vaccines. So let me turn to that. Um, so we started with this idea that when students transition from one life stage to another, like the transition from high school to college, for example, it's in those transition points that they are most vulnerable to self-doubt and most vulnerable to attrition. So it, it's no surprise that if we, if we introduce an intervention at that transition point, that intervention should have more bang for the buck. 
But the question, and one such intervention, might be peer mentors uh, in that first year of college. But the question that was unsettled uh, in the research literature is does the gender of that peer mentor matter? We predicted from our, our model that having a same-sex peer mentor in that first year of college should have a stronger effect than having a male mentor who is as good. Um, so we again conducted this longitudinal field experiment in, in engineering. We recruited students the summer before they came to college, all women, and we randomly assigned them to have a peer mentor who was a woman in the same major as they. So engineer, there are multiple engineering majors. We matched them up to the type of engineering. Uh, so they were either given a female mentor in the same major or a male mentor in the same major or no mentor. We trained the mentors in the, uh, in, the, in the few days before the academic year started. And then we asked the mentor and mentees to meet once a month and keep sort of an online diary that allowed us to track if they met, what they talked about, and, and so on. And this happened for that first year. And after that, the mentors graduated from, from college, but we kept track of the mentees across the board. So we, kept, we started tracking the mentees at baseline before the mentors had been assigned, the middle of the academic year in that first year, the end of the academic year, and then once a year at the end of sophomore year and junior year and senior year. So this study is still going on because it took that long to collect 150 women from the College of Engineering. But I'm going to show you data from the first uh, two, two years which is now, now published. So we track the mentees' progress across the year, across the two years. Um, so, but first, before I show you those data, let me say that male and female mentors were equally dedicated. When we asked the mentees, the women, how much support they got from their mentors, how uh, available their mentor was to them, how much chemistry they had with their mentor, on all of those metrics, they rated their, their mentor, whether she was a woman or he was a man, the same way. The only measures where we found a slight difference difference was how close they felt to the mentor and how similar they felt. So even though the mentors were equally good, the impact of those mentors on the student's own self-concept was profoundly different. So here's, so I'm going to show you a series of graphs that basically, uh, figures that basically show the same finding. In terms of social belonging, the black line here are the women randomly assigned to female mentors. The gray dashed line are male mentors, and the gray dotted line are no mentors. On the y-axis, zero is where the, where the women started. Positive numbers means that their feelings of belonging are increasing. Negative numbers means that their feelings of belonging in engineering are decreasing. What you see is that for women who happen to have a female mentor, their feelings of belonging held steady. However they felt in, about engineering when they walked into college, they ended their first year feeling the same way. Those who had male mentors or no mentors, their feelings of belonging in engineering dropped pretty sharply from beginning to end of the academic year. We found the same pattern of data when we looked at self-efficacy. How confident do you feel that, you're, that you have the chops to make it in engineering? Whatever women said when they walked into college, if they had a female mentor, the black line, that, that self-efficacy held steady. For those who had no mentors, the dotted line, their self-efficacy in engineering dropped sharply. And the male mentor condition, the dashed line, sort of hung out in the middle, non-significantly different from the controls. We measure threat and challenge. How worried do you feel about in your engineering classes versus how challenged, how motivated do you feel? And we took the ratio of threat versus challenge. So higher numbers means more threat, more worry and anxiety, less eagerness. Again, you see the same trend that those women who had female mentors, the black line, their feelings of threat don't change across the year. Those who had male mentors or no mentors, their worries and anxieties, their feelings of threat go up according across that academic year. Uh, and finally, we asked them, after you graduate from college, do you want to get a master's or a PhD in engineering? Same pattern of results that the women in, with female mentors, their interest in pursuing advanced degrees in engineering held steady. The women with no mentors or male mentors, their interest in pursuing advanced degrees dropped sharply across the year, significantly different from the controls, uh, from the uh, students with female mentors. So this is just the first year. Oh, let me show you one more, my favorite. Retention in engineering. So this is the end of the year. We are not talking about self-reports. We get their transcripts from the registrar's office, and we look at retention. How many students are still in engineering? 100% of the students who had female mentors were still in engineering. 
82% of those with male mentors were still in engineering, 89 in the control condition. And so, of course, 100% is different from the other two conditions. The controls and the male mentors are no different from each other. Okay, so end of first year. The mentors graduate, we are still following the mentees. Um, the pattern holds and in some ways becomes more accentuated. Here's feelings of belonging, women who originally one year earlier had female mentors, their feelings of belonging hold steady. Those who originally had male mentors, this is a bit of a surprise, they seem to sharply decline even more so uh, than the control condition. Not quite sure why, but the main point is that the female mentor group is the inoculator. Um, when we look at feelings of threat, not surprisingly, because engineering majors are tough, everybody's worries and anxieties go up by, in their sophomore year, but it goes up again much more strongly for those who originally had male mentors and much less strongly for those who had female mentors. Uh, we looked at intentions to pursue advanced degrees in engineering, same pattern of data. The women with female mentors one year earlier hold steady, the other two groups go down. Um, so this study, which, so I should say we're still following these women and what one of the things I want to see, uh, want to test, and it'll be interesting to see whether we get it, is if an intervention in that transition year to college, in that first year, if it has any ripple effects at graduation. So we are still tracking these, these women. Our last cohort, I think, are now, uh, will be entering their, their senior year. And in engineering, sometimes people take five years to, to finish, so we'll still be tracking them. Uh, so this is a real high risk, high reward kind of study, and so we'll, we'll see what happens. But the main takeaway is that in those four first four semesters of college, which is when the attrition is highest, that's when you introduce one sort of inoculator in that first year, and that carries you through those four semesters, uh, which is huge. And I should say that the number of times the mentor and mentees met was not once a month, it was only four times that academic year. The median meeting rates were four times. Those four meetings seemed to lead to this 100% retention. All right, so let me give you another example of how female peers are important, and that has to do with teamwork. So we all know um, that in science, more, more and more, and it was true in physical sciences and engineering, and it's true for us too, science is, is mostly team science. The question is, and, and we also predicted, and there's some research showing, that, that teams with female peers should act as social vaccines. What was not known is what percentage of women uh, is enough. How many do you need? Um, so again, we conducted this, this study on teamwork in engineering. We recruited women from the College of Engineering, uh, brought them into our lab to participate in what they thought was sort of a team study on, on a team challenge. Uh, we gave them, we told them that, that we would have the teams work on two challenges as a group and that the best team would get a prize. Uh, when they came into the lab, we randomly assigned them to one of three types of teams that varied in gender composition. Either a team where women were in the majority, three women, one man, or gender parity, two and two, or female minority, one woman with three other guys. What participants didn't know, but what you should know, is that in every team there was one real participant. And the three other people were engineering students, but they were trained by us, and they had sort of a limited number of things that they could stay, say, and so they were our constant. So the students met their teammates, uh, they got to know each other for a bit, but before we put them in the team, we, uh, we took them aside uh, and into private cubicles and measured how worried and threatened and anxious they felt about the upcoming team task, how challenged and motivated did they feel about it. We threw them into the teams and then we surreptitiously measured how much they spoke up. Uh, how much did these women jump in, help solve the problems uh, in each kind of team? After the task was over, we measured their self-efficacy. How confident did they feel about their own engineering ability? And how much did they intend to, major, to pursue careers in engineering? All right, so let me show you some data. So we found that gender composition of teams influences these feelings of threat and challenge. So what you're seeing here is the, the white bar are women uh, in my, with female minority groups, one woman with three other men. The dark gray bar are the 50-50 groups. The black bar are the 75% women group. The y-axis is how much threat they feel relative to challenge. So higher numbers are more bad. What you can see is that for women who were in the female minority group, 
they are the ones who felt most threatened and worried about how this task would go, uh, much more so than the women in the other two groups. We wondered if this was really driven by the first year students, the students who were just coming into college and they were suddenly in these teams where they were way outnumbered. So about 20% of students in engineering happen to be women and the number declines as you go through the years. So we broke the, the data I showed you by their year in college. So I'm going to show you first years versus everybody else um, and to look at the impact of gender composition of the teams on threat. So what you see here, the black bars are the first year students, the gray bars are the more advanced students. And what you can see is that for students in these, this uh, laser pointer doesn't work so well here, for students in the female minority condition, it's the first year students who are significantly more, more threatened than women in the gender parity groups and women in the female majority groups. For students who are more advanced, the gender composition of the team didn't have an effect on them. Either it's because they had built up some resilience or because they had left engineering, and we can't really differentiate between the two. But the first year women were the ones that were most affected. Uh, we also looked at how much the gender composition affected speaking up. And we found that women were much more likely to speak up and to so help solve the problems if they were in teams that was 75% women, so the majority groups, than the other two teams. And interestingly, this was not moderated by their year in college. So, and I should also say, we know that these women knew the answers to the problems because we had asked them to try and start solving the problem individually and then put them in the teams. So it's not as if the women in the other two groups didn't know the answers, but they were much more likely to be quiet if there were a lot of men in the group and much more likely to speak up if they were, if women were in the majority. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift, shift gears and say that all the work I've done ex until the last maybe four or five years was entirely on adults, on emerging adults. But not surprisingly, because stereotypes are learned very early, I became increasingly interested in, in social development and how when these stereotypes are learned and the impact on, on kids, especially kids in middle school. Um, in retrospect, I wish I had gone younger, but it's middle school for now. And we wanted to test the impact of social vaccines on, on middle school uh, kids. And particularly, we wanted to test whether seeing same-sex peers in classrooms and the type of pedagogy, the way the teacher teaches, whether those two factors might act as social vaccines. So we've recruited a bunch of kids from 10 schools across the country, some in California, some in Texas, some in uh, um, Pennsylvania, Delaware, all over the country. And I'm going to show you data from one year of that study. It's, that study is still continuing. So this is a longitudinal study where we recruited students from multiple schools. These are all co-ed schools. And we followed them from the beginning to the end of that eighth grade in their math class and in their science class. What we, and so I'm going to show you the data from science. We were interested in three kinds of classroom characteristics. One is how often are kids aware of having same-sex peers in their class who are high achievers, who are doing very well in science. Two, we, we, wanted to, we measured how much does the class emphasize the real world applications of science. Science is being humanistic, socially relevant, having social impact. And three, how much of the teaching in the class is collaborative rather than individual? So these are the three sort of classroom level variables we, we measured and we wanted to see their impact on students' everyday appraisals, particularly on their sense of self-efficacy and their own ability and their belonging in, in, in science. And finally, we measured the impact of all of this on outcome variables at the end of the academic year and we also measured it at the beginning as control variables. So we measured their attitudes towards science, their identification with science, how much did they speak up in science class, uh, what were their final grades in science, which we got from uh, the school with their parents' permission, did they want to take advanced science classes in high school? Did they want to take AP classes in science and their career aspirations? Uh, so again, let me show you some of the findings uh, that we have so far. So first, for both girls and boys, uh, we found that seeing same-sex peers who are high achievers had profoundly positive effects. So kids who saw same-sex uh, 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 kids in the science class tended to feel more similar 
to those peers, that predicted greater self-efficacy, which in turn mediated and predicted more favorable attitudes towards science, more identification with science, and we found the same pattern of data for multiple other variables. How much they spoke up in class was affected by seeing same-sex peers do well in science. Um, their final grades, they did better if there were a few kids in class of the same sex who did well. Their intentions to take advanced uh, science courses w was better, and finally their interest in, in science-oriented careers was higher. So all of this is, happens when they see other kids who are doing well in science of the same sex. And I, again, I should emphasize this happened to both girls and boys, which was uh, sort of a bit of a surprise. We also found that the way the class was taught mattered that kids who said that uh, my teacher emphasizes uh, or, or I learn about how science um, affects real world problems that I care about. So it had to be personal, it had to be humanistic, and there had to be social impact. When they understood the link between, between the science they were learning and its impact in the real world, they felt a greater sense of self-efficacy, which in turn predicted the same outcomes, more favorable attitudes, better, better identification with science. At the end of the eighth grade controlling for, for the beginning, and the same pattern held up for multiple dependent variables. The only place where we found that girls were affected differently than boys had to do with collaborative learning. When it came to um, the way science was taught, if the, it was, the subject was taught in a way that was more collaborative, girls seemed to benefit more, boys seemed to be less affected by it one way or another. So kids, classrooms that had more peer collaboration, more group learning, that predicted more self-efficacy for the girls, that predicted more favorable attitudes towards science and, and identification with science, and then the same outcome variables before. So the findings were really consistent across multiple dependent variables. Um, and the three things that mattered a lot about that classroom uh, um, sort of environment had to do with collaboration, to do with real world applications, and whether there were people like them, kids like them, who were doing well. All right, so I've thrown a lot of data at you, and whenever I present, people often ask, um, so what does this mean for, like, what should I be doing? Uh, so I want to take all the data and then mush it and give you the eight things that, that you should take away if you, um, for if you are in an organization or a department that cares about uh, gender diversity in STEM. And I should say, even though I'm talking about gender, because my data are on gender, uh, I think the same uh, takeaways apply to other groups like first generation students and students of color. One, I think our data say that we should be increasing students' contact with female faculty in science and engineering uh, early on so that young women can see people like them further along and imagine a similar future for themselves. Second, I think we should be funding peer mentoring programs uh, in STEM to foster relationships between first years, first year women students and students who are slightly advanced than them. Not that many years ahead, but advanced enough that, that they, have, they sort of have figured out how to navigate the system. Three, I didn't talk about it here, but our data show that having peer mentors articulate their own struggles early on in, in, uh, in their engineering major or in their STEM major more broadly seems to normalize first year students' own struggles and makes them be less likely to make dispositional attributions about why they might be struggling. And they understand this is a normative experience in college. Four, even in departments where the numbers of women are small, all faculty uh, of all genders can showcase the success of, of female scientists and engineers in other ways, by highlighting their research through their lectures, by showcasing examples through guest speakers, but through internships, through other kinds of extracurricular uh, um, events that, that departments and majors have. So there are other ways to showcase uh, the successes and the contributions and the innovations of women engineers and scientists that anybody can do. You don't have to be, be a female professor in a classroom. Um, so I think showing multiple avenues of, of change, of organizational change, uh, is, is sort of the, the point here. Um, five, our data show that, that early on, and I think this will be true also in college, but early on, emphasizing the social relevance 
of, of science and engineering by connecting theoretical principles that students are learning in class with its practical applications goes a big way in hooking interest. If students' interests are not hooked early on and they have sort of a prototype of what science is or engineering is or computer science is, it's hard to get them back later in college. But if you can frame uh, this is sort of classic persuasion. If you frame the field in terms of something that is much more socially relevant early on, then, then there, those effects are likely to carry on. Six, our data suggests that for girls and women especially, emphasizing collaborative learning in science and engineering is another way uh, to, to increase uh, diversity in STEM. Um, seven, for classes that involve team projects, uh, pay attention to the gender composition of the teams. Avoid teams with, with uh, solo women. One of my colleagues in uh, biochemistry, after reading the PNAS paper, uh, called me and said, I thought the best thing to do would be to have one of a kind of different kinds of students in my teams. I teach a team-based learning class. Uh, and I said, Jim, that might be good for the men, but I'm not sure it's good for the women in your class. So he and I are now doing a field experiment in his advanced biochem class, where the students are in these three-person teams and we are randomly assigning and varying the gender composition of the teams to see if what we found in the lab generalizes to the field. Uh, so this is sort of another sort of back between lab and field uh, uh, theme. And finally, in all the work I've done, um, timing matters hugely. The best bang for the buck is when those interventions are placed strategically in those transition periods when students are leaving one institution and entering another. Uh, and because their social comparisons are now unclear, they are more likely to internalize uh, uh, difficulty and interpret it as, as something about them than something about the environment. So I should say in, in, in closing that even though I'm the only one up here, this has really been team science. Uh, this, all of this work has been in collaboration with my current and former grad students and postdocs, most of whom are first authors on these papers. My colleagues in mathematics and engineering and now computer science are incredibly generous and have opened all kinds of doors that have made recruitment and doing these studies possible. Um, funding from the National Science Foundation that's funded my work from the beginning and without which these laborious studies would not be possible. And a very large and growing posse of undergraduate RAs who've collected the data, served as confederates, coded the data, um, and because of whom uh, the, the studies actually got done, and, and thank you. So all of the studies that I have, you can download from my website, uh, and the password is up there. Thank you. So I think I still have three minutes and 45 seconds. I didn't know that I would have time for questions, but I th we have three minutes and 40 seconds now. So I would love to hear your thoughts, your comments, questions, and uh, anything. Yes? So you're speaking to an uh, educational context? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so if you can't hear from the back, the question is about, the, the, these data are all about educational institutions. What generalizes from these data to organizations uh, in, in STEM and tech, for example? So I think in terms of onboarding, when, when, when employees are hired, in that first two years of, of their, their um, employment, they're sort of dropped into the company. And the mentoring intervention is a low-hanging fruit that I think would probably generalize very easily uh, to women and other uh, um, you know, employees of color who co go into institutions, companies where they are underrepresented. Um, and having a mentor who has been, been around for five or six years uh, in the company, I think that would, be, that would be one thing. The second thing is the, the team composition. I think a lot of the, of the work, the project, the project management is all done in teams. Um, and usually companies don't pay any attention to the gender composition of the teams uh, or anything. That's just not, not on their radar. Uh, but I think at the very least measuring what the com gender composition and race composition of the teams are and tracking the impact of that on innovation, impact on that on satisfaction of being in that project team, all of those things could be measured. 
and if the organization allows, it could probably be engineered uh, and manipulated. So I think those are the two, the two obvious ones. Um, but one of the things that I'm tr now in the process of doing through this Institute of Diversity Sciences that Mazreen talked about is create a network of uh, researchers, industry partners from tech especially, and engineering companies, uh, and community colleges and high schools to essentially ask them, where do you see us, the industry partners, where do you see the drop-offs? Is it that you, you're not getting the diversity coming in the door, or is it that you're not able to retain them? And then target interventions for those companies. So what I'm saying is about generalizing uh, the data from educational institutions to, to uh, companies and organizations, but I think that there's a lot more work that could be done if you put those partners together. Yeah, that's right. So maybe I'll ask the question loudly so you don't yeah. That's interesting. Which tells me that the opposite is also happening in a female dominated field, uh, mm -hmm. which I think we should be tracking to make sure that this is seen as the more gentle psychological right. phenomenon yeah. it is. Yeah. What it means to be a minority. Anyway. Yeah. But the part of what you said that I don't like the data that shows that women do better with women mentors. I mean, I just don't believe that that should be going into the future. The only way it can be. I think it is. I believe the data. Yeah. So, so I think that there, I have two answers to, I've been thinking a lot about, about what you're saying, and the data are what they are, um, and I think we don't want them to be that way. So I have two thoughts about this. One is I think that, that the matching matters more for that one year of transition. That after that, just like the, the gender composition of the team didn't have any effect on women who were sophomores, juniors, and seniors, I think that once you figure out the system, you're much more able to navigate the system regardless of who your mentors are. So I think the match may matter more initially than it does later. But the other thing I would say is that even when the mentors or the instructors are of the other uh, gender, the thing to do is to highlight examples of success from the student's own group. Um, so imagine a faculty member teaching uh, genetics or teaching engineering and apps, when they talk about sort of prototypical experiments or innovations and so on, if they don't mention the gender of the investigator, the assumption is that it's, it's a man. But if a male professor says, let me tell you about this really cool study that I just, that just got published, and talks about the study and talks about the innovation, but just incidentally posts the picture of the person, I think that's enough. That's, that's actually, that's an experiment I do want to do. Uh, I don't think the instructor or the mentor has to be a woman. I think they, but they have to amplify the contributions of women. Uh, and if they do, just like the experiments with, with biographies, I think the result will be the same. But we really do, I mean, that's my, that's my hypothesis, but we really need to do the experiment where you have instructors who are men and women, and you have some using examples that amplify the underrepresented group as part of their course, and some who don't, and then look at the outcomes. And then you can say, uh, do you really need to have the match or not? So one question at the back, and then Brent, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right.
Yeah, so again, so this was the, the I think in the case of trans students in, in academia, regardless of, of field, uh, is, a, is a great example where you could do both a case study, but you could also do a social network study uh, and see who their, who their professional network is. So their advisor and, and their uh, members of their lab are most likely to be non-trans, right? They're most likely to be cisgender. But they might have other people in their professional network that they actively seek out who are trans. Um, this is something that's uh, come up with a colleague of mine in physics who is really interested, and he has uh, trans students uh, in his lab, uh, and he is interested in looking at the impact of, of students' gender identity and whether having somebody like them in their professional network has an impact. So the, the match, again, doesn't have to be with the advisor. It could be somebody else who who are who's on the path and who's successful. I think that's the main key thing. Somebody on their path, like them, they are not invisible, who is successful. And that person could be through the media, it could be the advisor, it could be a fellow student, it could be many different things. Uh, Bert. Yeah. Is there other, uh, are there other s uh, interventions? interventions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, so the, the question is, are there other interventions besides gender matching that would have the same, same, same impact? So I think my answer is the, is the, is, is the same answer I, I, I gave uh, Mazreen, that, that it could be that the gender matching is not from the mentor, it's coming from uh, what the mentor amplifies. It could also be that the other variables that we measured in our last study, like the social relevance of the field, uh, rather than the field being abstract and not having any, any social relevance, or collaborative learning rather than competition and outsmarting one versus another. So I think those kind of climate or culture variables could be another, another variable that would increase uh, both recruitment and retention. So I think this is, this is why I like jumping back and forth between the lab and the field, because you can, you can also me measure individual variables, but then you, then you can do these um, sort of structural things, much like what sociologists would do, where the unit of analysis is the class or the cohort. And you can measure how competitive or cooperative or collaborative they are, uh, and look at the impact of that local culture on student outcomes and their individual uh, outcomes, on I mean individual variables on students' outcomes, and then see what sort of carries more, more, more weight. If you change the culture or the environment, and in science it might be the lab culture. Um, so I think the, the, the gender match is not the only variable. But I don't think we usually do any of these, uh, which is why we end up recruiting people and then having a revolving door. We are out of time, and I think the next group is supposed to come in, but I'll hang out outside. If you have other thoughts or questions, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Thank you.